So here we are. Let's talk about the uh, physical camera in Fine Render. And when we talk the physical camera in Fine Render, we talk about the physical camera in 3D Studio Max. Uh, Fine Render does support the physical camera uh, to the full extent, uh, so there is no extra object needed. You can just use the standard camera that comes or which is now standard in 20, since 2016, the physical camera. You should always use the physical camera because Fine Render is an unbiased path tracer and uh, it works with real world values. It's physically accurate, so it needs a real environment and real world uh, values to um, uh, operate. Let's just have a look at the scene here. Um, I created this scene uh, with an asset I got from TurboSquid, so uh, I'm very thankful for TurboSquid to support us there with their assets. So this um, 3D bug or scarab we have here um, was just placed there and I created a little bit of a surrounding. Um, so nothing fancy, nothing really complex. I have a plane. Uh, I have an uh, extruded object here that this is a puddle of water, so that should simulate a little bit of water. And um, I have a texture on thrown onto the plane, a sand texture, as well as some uh, strange things I did here in the scene. And uh, I have to admit, I just did it to uh, test it out. So you may use it or not. It depends on you how... how realistic you want to go. So what I did here, here in the far distance, we have this simple objects uh, made out of uh, geospheres uh, in various resolutions. It's very low res right now, but this uh, stuff is meant to be my sand grains. So what I did is I instanced uh, sand grains here. So every little um, cube or, or yeah, cube you see here is uh, a set of my sand grains in various sizes and orientation and all this. So there's a lot of randomness in there and you can see uh, the scaling is in all different directions. So what I try to create is I have a sand texture, which is flat. I didn't want to use bump or any, anything like that. And on the sand texture, that's my, my lowest layer. On top of it, I sprinkle a little bit of grain uh, of sand there. So um, that's the thing I did. And how did I do that? You don't need to buy any extra scattering tool. You can do this out of the box with Fine Render. Fine Render comes with its own scattering tool and it's really powerful. Usually you would pay for such a tool alone 200 bucks or more. And that just comes with Fine Render and it's there for you to use. You can use um, uh, create amazing stuff with it. And I'll show you a second scatter I use here in the scene. So uh, let's just um, have a few uh, at the scatter tool. So you just say where you want your stuff distributed. You pick your objects and then you can decide random distribution, random scale, random rotation, uh, based on the slope and, and all this kind of stuff you want. And all these are instances, so they are highly efficient when rendering. So this is what I used for my sand on the floor, the sand grains. And I'm going to use... Also, I use another scatter object on my beetle um, itself. So I wanted to have some sand, like there was water washing over this uh, beetle, and I wanted to have it uh, also sand grains besides water drops I just placed on, on the surface. So we have these water drops and some sand sticking to uh, the beetle. The, the cool thing about this setup is I can define how dirty this beetle uh, should get. So we can have, for example, um, here I set the amount of uh, dirt grains I want on the beetle. So I can say, okay, I just want to have uh, 10 uh, grains of dirt on the, on the beetle. Or uh, <clears throat> here we see the uh, grains. Or I just increase it a little bit. As you can see, I can increase the amount of dirt that's on the uh, scarab. And I can even go to, let's say, 5,000. So now the, the buck is covered totally in dirt. 
um if i were to render this right now let me just render it you would just see a, a sand sculpture and not uh, a real uh, bug or scarab I want to have here, this beetle. So that's the cool thing about the scatter tool. Once more, scatter uh, tool comes with fine render. You don't have to pay for it. It's already there. It's a really powerful tool, especially for architecture and stuff. But as you can see, you can use it also for these kind of things. You can make things dirty and, and put uh, dirt on objects. So all this is inside of uh, fine render. And we can just, um, let me just go back to my original value of 800. And then we, we, we can see uh, how the scene looks like. Let me just render the scene again. And then we will have a look at how our uh, rendering looks like. So what else we have here in the scene is the daylight system. So that's my source of light, the sun, and that's it. Also, the material is using um, thin film material so that we get this shimmering, uh, color changing effect uh, based on the reflection and surface and all this and the environment. And we have these water drops here as well with uh, a little bit of uh, this dispersion effect. Um, however, to make this scene look really cool and realistic, if, we, if you know um, about these when small things are photographed, you usually have a blur around it and only a focal point, and we want to simulate that. And for this, we need our physical camera, and the physical camera has an effect called depth of field, and this simulates the focusing effect of a camera. So before we dive into that, let's have a look at the physical camera, because still for some of you, it might be... Uh, a new thing or still a, a strange thing to use in 3D Studio Max. Um, so the camera itself is uh, like a standard, similar to a standard camera. Let me just go that we can see the camera everywhere. Okay. Um, so it has, for example, the target distance. So when we change the target distance, it will change our target distance. That's what we would expect. However, with a physical camera, there is one effect that's strange at first because it, the standard camera doesn't have that. When we change our target distance, so I move the target distance away, you will see something strange happen that's usually unexpected. Um, I just moved the target distance. I didn't change the focal length. So my focal length of the camera is still the same. I didn't touch it. I just changed the target distance, so where my focal plane is. So by changing the focus, it looks like it's changing my zoom or focal length. So that's something uh, you need to get used to because it's a physical camera. And this effect is called lens breathing. So all weird and fancy stuff. Usually in the real world, lens breathing is not that much of an issue because you can't control it anyway. And you have to live with it and that's it. And camera manufacturers usually don't tell you about lens breathing um, because they, they are, have a hard time uh, getting this under control. And with very expensive lenses, you, you get nearly a, a near perfect lens without lens breathing. But usually it is because uh, when you have a, a zoom lens and you twist and then the lenses get shifted in and out so they actually change physically their position so that's why uh, your uh, zoom uh, is changing <clears throat> so let me bring this back to my scarab where i want my focal plane so i want to concentrate on the scarab here so keep in mind this changes and the lens breathing is a, a uh, value a parameter you we have here this lens breathing so we can turn this off if we don't want that if we want it to to work like the old style uh, 3d studio max cameras we can do that just set it to null set lens breathing to null to zero um, you can then adjust your focal plane or target distance as you want and you see it's no longer changing our zoom level so keep that in mind. That's the new thing with a physical camera. 
when you have lens breathing, and that's the default effect, lens breathing is set to one by default. So now when you change your target distance, it will change the zoom level or field of view or however you want to, to call it. Um, this is important. So keep this in mind when you think, oh, something strange is going on with these physical parameters. And as I said, in the real world, this lens breathing, uh, it happens. It depends on how expensive your lens is. Sometimes it happens stronger and, and not so strong. So, but usually it's not an issue. But what you want is for photorealistic uh, reproduction of effects, you want this lens breathing effect. So if you happen to know the amount of lens breathing your camera lens has, then you can reproduce the real world effect. But what users are usually used to see is that when you uh, change the focus, it also changes a little bit of your zoom level or um, the field of view. Um, so keep that in mind. The default setting, I think, is, is okay. We, we have here in 3D Studio Max. Um, so as, as I say, we do support this in, in uh, Fire Render. So Fire Render supports all the physical camera parameters uh, that are important and needed. So uh, let me just do the same thing here. We have the lens breathing at one. Um, let me do the same thing here and I'll change the uh, target distance. And you see, we actually support the lens breathing effect as well, because that is what's needed for a physically accurate camera. Okay, let me go back to my uh, focus plane, put to the uh, little buck there to the beetle, and then Let's continue with the settings. So, as I mentioned, the focal length, this is our Taylor zoom length, lens, or however you want to uh, call it. Um, this defines how much zoom we have. When I go to 50, I have a very wide view. And when I go back to 100, I'll zoom into the object. And when I go to 200, we can zoom even further into details we have here. So I'll go back here and you see it. The fire render is following in real time all the effects I'm doing here. We do also have a zoom value. The zoom value in the physical camera does a similar thing. It zooms into your scene, but it's more like a, a crop thing. And we will discuss this when we have a depth of field effect as well. So, but it's similar to, to changing the, the focal length and you can zoom into an object. However, it changes a little bit when we have our depth of field on. Um, then the most important part is our aperture. This aperture, we are talking right now about depth of field, so we want this nice, blurry, macro, macro uh, photography look. The aperture is the only parameter that's setting how blurry your distance or how your depth of field works. So aperture is the only thing that controls it. There's no other parameter there. It might look like that the zoom, the focal length, uh, does something, but it's not. It's the same um, depth of field value. You just zoom into it. Um, <clears throat> so keep that in mind. If you want to control your blur, you have to con uh, use the aperture. Um, and here is the most important setting we want to talk now is we turn on our uh, depth of field. And now you get this really uh, sense of scale, the nice focus onto the uh, front of the beetle and this nice blurring out of the background and the foreground. So now you can see how easy it is uh, to control the depth of field in Fire Render and 3D Studio Max with the physical camera. So <clears throat> as I said, the amount of blur or your focal plane, how, how your depth of field works, is controlled by the aperture. So when we increase that, 
we reduce the blur or widen the depth of field. So we get a, a wider range where we have a sharp or in focus area. And when I increase this even further, um, we get it um, much, much um, sharper in, in a larger area. The effect you see now, the picture got darker. The aperture also controls the exposure if you are not setting to automatic exposure. So right now we have it to manual exposure. So we have to work with our uh, exposure control as well. We have to raise our exposure to get our brightness back because we made uh, the aperture much, much smaller. So from an aperture from this size, we went down to this. That means less light, but it will create a, a sharper uh, image. And the bigger the aperture is, the um, more blurry it will be. So. Keep that in mind, by increasing uh, the aperture, you might also need to increase the uh, um, exposure. So these are the two settings that interact which are the, with each other or are connected to each other. So now we can control here with the aperture where we want to focus on. So I still think that the initial thing when we go to eight, now we increase again, we let more light in. Uh, we have to go down as well with our exposure so that we get uh, to our nice uh, exposure. And if you don't want to do that, there is an option that gives you an automatic exposure. So you can just say, I want this exposure value, or let's go a little bit, a little bit darker maybe. Uh, just freeze it a little bit. So. You can set your target exposure and then uh, 3D Studio Max will calculate all the other values so that you always get this exposure. Um, that means now you can change the aperture without changing the exposure. So now with the aperture, we change our focal uh, plane or depth of field where we want to have our fo focus uh, in the image. And as I said, the focus plane right now is set with the target distance. So we are aiming here right at the beetle front here. And we check all the dimensions at the leg. So um, what we can do now is we can go back to our camera and select a little bit further into the beetle so we move now our focal plane more back to, uh, from the beetle and let me let's oh sorry wrong direction let me just overdo it a little bit and move it way back to the uh, back of the beetle and as you can see now our focus uh, plane moved way back so now we are focusing on this back leg and everything in front is blurred and everything in the back is still blurred. But now we have our focal plane at this uh, level. So our target uh, controls this, uh, the focal plane where we want to see the crisp and nice and sharp areas in our image. So I'll go back to 11. And as I said, because we have now the um, automatic exposure turned on, we can easily control the amount of blur or how big our area is where we can see a clear crisp image. So I'll increase that and we widen it. Or if I go even very low, we can make it highly focused just on this level. So you can pinpoint an area on the beetle itself even to focus on that. So it's a very powerful tool uh, photographers use and you have the same tool now as well in file render file render supports really this physically uh, accurate camera and all the parameters you just saw they're supported and they behave like a real world camera so you can use that to focus here on your objects and adjust the exposure levels and, and everything else um i wanted to tell you one more thing um with the uh, lens breathing. You remember the lens breathing was the uh, um, link to changing your focal plane or target distance. 
So when I change the target distance, it changed the field of view or the zoom level a little bit. So there is one way to use this to your advantage when you switch to uh, uh, the field of view setting. So we don't want to have the focal length anymore. So we are going to specify our field of view. So now we say, I want this field of view angle fixed. So now everything is fixed on this field of uh, view we have here. And now when I adjust the lens breathing, something really uh, strange happens or unexpected. Let me just uh, overdo it a little bit and increase it. And when you watch the image now, we are reducing uh, the depth of field effect. So that's something uh, that is uh, a strange behavior, I would say, because the lens breathing is only connected to your uh, changing of the zoom level or field of view. So lens breathing does not affect your depth of field. But in this case, you can fine tune your depth of field. When you fix, as, as I said, you fix now your focal. Usually lens breathing changes your field of view. Now you fix it. So all the other calculations take place. And now you can use that to fine tune uh, your depth of field area. So when I turn this down to zero, you see we are back to our very fine narrow band of uh, depth of field. When I increase that, let's say to 10, I can widen my depth of field here. So keep that in mind. When you fix the uh, field of view, you can use the lens breathing to adjust after the fact your, your depth of field effect, which you can't really do in the real world, but it's possible. So I'm going back to, uh, let me just, reset this to our old setting where we have real camera values usually you your macro would have 100 or 90 millimeters and then you would go from there and adjust your uh, settings in the physical camera um from the exposure i already discussed we can set it to a manual exposure which is nice when you want to adjust only depth of field and other settings or you choose a manual exposure where you set the ISO level like you know it from your camera. Another interesting thing is you can also change. So now we are back to normal camera operation. Like in the real world, a physical camera would work. We can zoom into uh, the object by going to a 200 millimeter focal plane. And now you will see uh, another interesting effect we also do support with the physical camera in file render is this bokeh effect. So the longer we let it uh, render, the, the nicer they will get and, and the clearer. But you see this uh, effect here um, that's out of focus bright spots in your image. And these out of focus Im uh, spots, they create these uh, artifacts. Uh, these come from your aperture, how many blades it has and so on. And this can also be set in our um, uh, physical camera. And here we go. Here's our bokeh effect. In the bokeh effect, you can set the amount of blades or you can say, okay, I just want a, a circular effect here. Let me just go back to circular. And then you will see we are getting round circles instead of these seven-sided uh, objects. So they are now uh, round, nice and smooth. Or we can set the blades and then we can also even adjust the angle at which we want to have these uh, things happening. And we can make, <clears throat> for example, things like this, triangles, um, which I doubt exist. That must be a special effect then, but you can have triangles if you want. Um, so this is also supported. So all the physical camera effects you need are in 3D Studio Max and Fine Render really supports them like a real world physical camera. And the best of all is everything you adjust, you can see in real time in your rendering right here. So you always know what's going on. You always know 
what effect or what the exposure looks like or what the materials look like and, and uh, everything. So <clears throat> the next effect that's also related or connected to a camera is motion blur. Let me move to a different uh, scene here. So I'm going to have a motion blur. And the first thing we want to do is um, explore a little bit how motion blur is working in Final Render and how did we integrate motion blur in uh, Final Render. So we have this uh, little scene here and motion blur means, means motion. So something has to move. If, I, uh, if nothing is moving, you don't see motion blur. Okay, should be obvious, but I just want to mention it. So things have to move to get motion blur. Um, let's move the frame slider here and we can see actually there is something moving. At least I see these uh, balls moving here. <clears throat> now for fast movements, you get motion blur effects. So then let's have a look if that actually works. And as we can see, there's no motion blur. Maybe it's just the first frame. Nothing has moved at first uh, frame. Okay, let me just move the frame. And as you can see, Final Render is tightly integrated in 3D Studio Max and it offers the best active shade of all renderers you get out there. I'm absolutely confident. There's nothing that updates or uh, iterates all the parameter changes you have as fast as we do and as deep as we do. So you can play here on the fl frame slider and it will update everything in here. And I mean everything, material changes, motion blur, everything. So that's really a powerful thing we have here in Fire Render. So you can keep this active shade open, continue working, you will get your updates there. And it does everything. You can move objects, create new objects and, and all these uh, kind of things. So it's really a, a powerful thing. And even the integrated renderers in 3D Studio Max, they can't do that. Um, but back to motion blur. So how do we get motion blur on, uh, on objects? So to get motion blur on objects, we need to tell the renderer, hey, I want to have motion blur. Usually you would say physically accurate renderer, there's always motion blur. You can't decide in the real world motion blur or not. Still, um, we want to... Um, we can decide in Final Render only a few objects get motion blur or all objects get motion blur or whatever we want. And that's done also through standard 3D Studio Max procedures. So there is no extra thing you have, no extra rollout menu, nothing complicated you have to learn. You just open your properties and under the motion blur, you just click object, that's it. We, are, we only support the object motion blur because that's the only real one. Final Render is a physically accurate renderer. It creates real, realistic results and uh, exactly behaves like the real world thing. So that's it. We told all the object properties, object motion blur on these objects. Now, if I'm going to render again, we start to see motion blur. And even when I move here, in the frame slider, you see we can check in real time our motion blur effect. And as we as the objects get slower, we will see less motion blur. And let me go back right to the beginning. Here we have a high, really high motion blur effect. Objects nearly becomes transparent. And here again. So you get your real-time feedback of the motion blur. You can adjust the motion blur. And now the question is, the movement speed of the object defines how much blur, how, how much streak you see here, how much motion blur you will have here. So what if you wanted more motion blur, even the object isn't move, moving fast? And here we go back to the physical camera and in the physical camera, we do support this second section here, enable motion blur. And the motion blur only depends on the shutter speed. So the longer you expose the film, 
the longer your streak or motion blur will be. So that's like in the real world, it works exactly the same like in your camera you have. The longer you expose uh, the image, the longer your streaks will get. So, uh, and also, it depends how fast your object is. Like in, in 3D Studio Max, if your object is, is moving that fast, you can uh, um, have a very long exposure and still it won't change your thing. So it has all uh, still be in relation uh, to the speed of the object and the shutter speed as well. But what we can do here is, let me just reduce the motion blur. I'll go to a hundredth of a second. And now I didn't change the frame. The motion blur is nearly gone. With a hundredth of a second, we already get nice uh, capture of the image. Let me go to two hundredths of a second. And now we capture, like in the real camera, the higher camera, like the higher your shutter speed, the more you freeze the frame. Um, it's exactly uh, uh, the same in Far Render. And we can go back now to a 50th of a second. Now we start to see again our motion blur, or we go even to a fifth of a second. And now we get really long streaks here um, where the motion is really extreme. So that's it. Keep in mind to get motion blur, object motion blur in Fine Render. You have to select the object, right-click properties, turn object motion blur for that object on. And that's all you need to do. Then you get your motion blur. And obviously you have to activate motion blur in your camera as well. So to get motion blur at all with your camera, you just have to turn this uh, motion blur in the camera setting on. And then it's only the shutter speed that controls how much blurring, how much streaking you see. There's one more other type of motion blur. So that's objects. So when objects move, however, there's also one last uh, type of uh, motion blur and that's the camera motion because the camera can move as well. So it's not only the object. So the camera is static and the object is moving. Then you get your motion blur. You can also move the camera and then you get motion blur. And the cool thing is, and photographers use that a lot, or uh, people doing a film, you, sometimes, uh, especially in, in car photography, um, you want to have the car uh, fixed and sharp, but everything else around the car blurred. So you move the same speed as the car. So relative to camera to car is standing still but the background is moving very fast so you get a blurred background but the object that's moving the same speed like the camera is sharp in focus so you can do that and this is also supported in fine render so what we have here is this little camera path i did so that's my master animation i have here uh, let's have a look here at front so nothing fancy going on just the camera moving just want to make sure camera movement also covered and working. So let's have camera move here and have a look. So right now we don't see any motion blur from the camera at all. So the object is fair stone bounce. We can uh, combine everything so that works as well, but just uh, to talk about each individual type of motion blur, uh, the uh, spheres are fixed right now. So we don't see any motion blur from the camera, even the camera is moving. Um, and the reason for that is also very simple because I prepared this scene, the enable motion blur is missing. And for that, I want to mention that the camera motion blur is always taken into account. So you don't have to worry about setting anything special. When the camera moves, we always have the motion blur here. So when you turn on the motion blur, you get your camera motion blur without doing anything special. And the same deal is true here. The shorter our exposure time, the less motion blur you have. So a hundredth of a second will already give us a little nice, what I think, a nice realistic motion blur. But we can overdo it as well. We go to 50th of a second or 20th of a second, whatever you like. That controls the motion blur. 
And once more, we have real-time feedback here in our active shade in, in FireRender and 3D Studio Max. So you always know what's going on. You always have control, full control of your settings here and how it works. And that's about it. This uh, concludes my stream about the physical camera, motion blur, and depth of field. Let me just summarize again what we just saw here in this little uh, stream about fire and physical camera. So my first thing I did with the Beetle is define motion blur. Important thing with the physical camera is there's one new thing that's the lens breathing uh, parameter. So the lens breathing changes your field of view um, or multiplies it when you change the target distance. Um, that's the important thing to, to remember. But you can use this to your advantage to uh, actually change the depth of field parameters a little bit. Um, then we learned about the object motion blur. Object motion blur means per object we can decide, okay, you get motion blur, you don't get motion blur. So you do that with the properties option in 3D Studio Max. And then we had the camera motion blur, which is the easiest one. You just turn it on and that's it. I hope you like this and uh, check out our other final render uh, videos as well. We have now several tutorial videos explaining materials, lights, uh, and, and many more things. Just check them out. Um, and thank you for watching the stream. Goodbye.